guys, welcome to another episode of the Network Assist Podcast. This is a very special episode because I'm joined by a very special guest. She happens to write for Scouted Football and is also a scout for Africon. She has probably been a really good Twitter friend for me in the last year or so, I guess. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Alex Collins to the show. Welcome, Alex. <laughs> Hi, Rithik. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Just before moving on to the podcast uh, and discussing the main topics, I just wanted you to probably explain a bit to the listeners about what you do at Scouted as well as Africa. Okay, so for Scouted, I basically just contribute to the to the handbooks. Shu, who's I think I pronounced his name right. He yeah, he just contacted me for the query piece, and then luckily, so I did that for volume nine, and then luckily, yeah, I got to write volume. 10 I got a ride on Kamaldin and then the feature piece on the Right to Dream Academy and its connection with FC Norgeland and yeah hopefully I get to ride on future ones but that's pretty much what yeah you know, what I do for Scouted very happy to be able to contribute to that and then yeah for Africon I work as a scout for them also do a bit of the social media need to get back to doing that more <laughs> it's been a hectic period but yeah so basically what we are is a scouting consultancy that focuses on finding sort of pathways um, kind of similarly actually to which is why I like um, Ride to Dream so much about how they manage these transitions and pathways from an academy in Garda to football in Denmark, finding these pathways for players to go and, yeah, to go to clubs, not necess- not actually in the bigger leagues, in the top five European leagues or even Netherlands or whatever, but looking at Scotland, the Nordic, uh, Scandinavian leagues, around there, Poland as well, um, and Belgium. And yeah, basically it's a good first step for players in, from Africa going into Europe. And yeah, exciting stuff. That's that's great to hear. And I mean, that sounds really, really exciting. Uh, Scouted is probably one of my favorite like content creators as well. Uh, I think Volume 9 probably was the first handbook I managed to buy, though. But I mean, that that probably is just the beginning of that because it's, it's really good content out there. And yeah, I've heard a lot about Africon as well. Uh, I mean, by a pair from Twitter, obviously. So, yeah, it's it's great to hear uh, all the stuff happening. And, yeah, African players and, you know, some of the brightest talents in Africa is something that we're going to discuss in the pod, but probably in the, probably towards the last segment of the show. But the main agenda today is to talk about League One and how the season's gone, uh, about a couple of teams as well. One of them is the team that you support, Leon. But we will start with the league winners, the champions, Leon. So they just lost three games this season in League One. 64 goals scored, 23 goals conceded. And if you look at the goals conceded, they have the best defense in that regard. But, I mean, I've seen you mention on Twitter as well, saying that uh, that Leon probably aren't like, they probably wearing like champion material overall. Probably if you look at some underlying numbers as well, I think that supports your argument uh, to an extent because I mean I'm uh, I'm fetching stats from understat as well as FP ref or stats form. So the expected goal difference is fourth. With, that was fourth in League One. Um, their expected points as well also were fourth. So they weren't really like blistering in terms of underlying numbers defensively i think they were solid their expected goals against as well in terms of that as well they're like standing out as the topmost team in league one so alex what actually went right for lille this season in your opinion and do you think i mean i i know this is like a very not 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 the right statement to make when i say that they aren't deserve winners because every champion deserves uh, the title, obviously. But do you think uh, they've been outright winners, or on what, what's the whole point? Um, so it's interesting, actually, that you said that the underlying numbers suggested that they are fourth um, in terms of expected points and expected goal difference. Did you say? Um, yeah, because actually, I, had, I hadn't seen those numbers. I do know that they overperformed. Um, their attacking numbers, I've heard. Um, but yeah, that's actually exactly what I've said. I think they were the fourth best team this season, which is, I guess, also as a Lyon fan, where we underperformed our numbers a bit. I was a bit salty <laughs> at one stage. <laughs> um, but 
but yeah, so I do think that they actually were the fourth best team, I have to say. Um, I think they were the best defensive side. Uh, I was really impressed with their defense. Um, and they were a good defensive side last year as well. Very good. Um, but yeah, I think just in terms of attack, there was a lot of overperformance. They never really, I don't know. For me, for me, they didn't really, um, yeah, they just, they didn't ever seem as dominant as I would say Lyon, um, and PSG. Obviously, PSG had a down season, but still probably, yeah, you know, PSG with talents like Neymar and Mbappe, you're not going to be, and then Di Maria, you're not going to be weaker. Um, and then also I thought Monaco, especially from the second half of the season, were, were very, very impressive. Um, and I'm actually looking forward to seeing how they do next season under Kovac. Um, but yeah, I, I would say everything built off for Lille, off of their defense, um, which was, I don't know what, what you want me to explain what they did well tactically or, so yeah, I'll just explain, um, what my understanding of their tactics is. Yeah. Generally kind of almost a mid or low block, um, deeper down. And then they had Joseph Fonte, who have like more and more over the years I have more respect for. For me, he's actually their player of the season. I know that's a weird sort of comment to make, considering there's all that hype about Yilmaz and a lot of the younger guys and Botman. But yeah, um, and then yeah, they just had they have they have a good group of attackers, but I didn't see anyone. Maybe apart from Yilmaz, is actually being um, particularly stand out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you. Uh, I mean that that's one of our patron questions as well from our patron data about. Uh, who who Leon, as Lille's standout player was this season? So you're gonna go with Font despite Yale mass scoring 16 goals. Yeah. So <laughs> so I would say that they were, they didn't have they had a number of players who played very well this season. Um, I know yeah, Magnan the goalkeeper, then both their centre backs, um, Botman, who yeah, I think we'll, we'll probably get into. I know we've, you're planning to speak about some of the younger Lille guys, who I think is maybe a little bit overrated at this point, but he was very, very good this season. Um, Fonte was very, very good. I think Benjamin Andre goes under the radar a bit. He was very good. Um, then, yeah, Yilmaz. And then there were guys who had different good points of the season. Yaziki wasn't used that much, but he was very good when he played. Bamba started off very well. Um... Jonathan David started badly, but actually was very impressed with him by the end of the season. So yeah, uh, if I had to pick, if I had to pick one, I would pick Jose Fonte though. I think he was the, be- the best defender, um, and I think it's a it's a it's a title win, kind of based on how good their defenses was, uh, with some attacking overperformance, I would say. Yeah, fair, <laughs> and I mean. Christophe Galtier actually, uh, I think he joined Lille, I think uh, late 2017. I think it was it in December, just just before 2018. The new I can't year that makes sense. He left in 2016 yeah. from from Saint Etienne. So yeah, mm. that makes. Sense. So I mean, it's been like uh, it's been around three and a half seasons at Lille, and it looks like he's going to leave at the end of the season. And yeah. we're going to talk about. Uh, the instability part uh, at Lille or the situation at Lille right now, but how much of credit would you give give to Gaultier for this league title? Um, I think I give a lot in in the sense that I don't actually think they should have been title winners, but yeah, let me not keep pushing that. Um, but I think it, it definitely comes down to him. He's a very good coach, very competent coach. Um, and yeah, he built pretty successful tactics with their four two two. Four two two two. Sorry. Um. Yeah, I think it was pretty good tactics. Nothing super exciting. Kind of a higher press, high up the pitch. But then as it came lower, they would sit back a bit. Um. So he definitely knew where to get the most out of guys like Jonathan David higher up, or kind of forcing crosses in for Botman and Fonte to deal with. So I think yeah, lots of tactical strengths made the best out of the players and he's kind of shown over his entire t- his entire career he's a good person to bring a lot out of his players um so yeah i would credit him as much as 
anyone in delivering their victory for sure, in delivering their title of success. Yeah, that sounds fair. And I mean, like like you mentioned though, um, Lille are probably not, despite the you know, league title win, they're not probably in the best shape right now. They're looking mm-hmm. off to sell a lot of players. Galtier seems like he's going to leave as well for Nice, I guess. Uh, I, I, I mean, I've been hearing rumors of that. And there's a lot going at Lille. Uh, if I'm not wrong, they are not really good at the moment financially as well. So, mm-hmm. Alex, uh, what do you think is the whole reason for the whole uh, for, for this instability? To, to be honest. Um. So I think a lot of instability is just in the French league in general. So because of the whole media pro thing, um, I you know so I don't speak French, which is something I obviously want to do eventually. But so I didn't get all of it. But yeah, um, that's kind of dumb, that's kind of hit a lot of French clubs quite badly, and they haven't handled it that well, Lille. And then also Campos has left. Um, they already were a smaller budget team compared to the success, to be fair to them. Um, yeah, so I think selling is necessary at this point. Um, yeah. And like uh, Mike Mangan, is, I think he's agreed a deal with AC Milan. I think he was a captain right. as well. So I think he's, he also had like a pretty good season and pretty good spell at Lille. So he's going to be a really good signing for AC Milan. Uh, since Donnarumma looks like uh, leaving. And like you mentioned, there are a lot of good young players as well. Sven Botman, who had a lot of interest uh, even in January, I think it was like, very widely rumored with Liverpool since uh, we were like short on centre-backs. So he was like heavily, heavily, heavily linked with Liverpool in January. Yeah. And was signing I, for Liverpool. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and and I, I think he's going to be like still uh, linked with a lot of clubs this summer. There is Celic as well. Renato Sanchez, who had a tough spell at England first and then again returned to Benfica. I think he's kind of been pretty good at Lille. So he's also been attracting a lot of interest uh, in Europe recently. Jonathan Ikone and Jonathan David, especially, uh, I think, after Lille signed him last summer, I think he had difficulties in the beginning. I think his numbers weren't that good either. But he has kicked on probably as the season went further. Then Sumare as well, I think he's, he's also probably leaving for Leicester, if I'm not wrong. So the, mm-hmm. there are a lot of young players and they are all leaving. So Alex, I would like to probably ask you about the young talents that we will have and how good they are. Um, sure, who would you like to start with? From the back? Goalkeeper? Yeah, let's start well, from the defense. That just the right. yeah. Um, yeah, I think he's Mike Manian is very good. Um, he's been good for a while. Um, kind of interestingly, like he almost seems to have like a good season and then like a, wouldn't say bad, but like a non- you know, not standout season and then a good season, not standout season. And yeah, so I'll be interested to see how he does at um, AC Milan. I can't really speak for how good a replacement he is for Donnarumma. Don't watch enough of of Milan, but obviously Donnarumma is regarded as one of the best goalkeepers in the world already. So it's probably a downgrade, but but not a big one. And he's a good young goalkeeper still. So I think it's good business done by... By AC Milan for sure. Um, yeah, he. I think this year, this season, I could be wrong, but I think he had the second best um, post shot expected goal difference um, out of all the keepers in Ligue 1. And then also he's he's solid with his, he's solid with the ball at his feet and good at claiming crosses. So he's kind of all round, I'd say, as a keeper. Um, yeah, so I think he's. He's good business. He was definitely, I think, over the course of the season, probably the best goalkeeper in the league um, and a big part of their success. Also, I think a big part of what made Lille so strong is because a lot of in their defensive shape is about pushing, pushing attacking teams out wide. 
and then trying to get balls in. And they sit quite deep, so there's not much space in behind. And I think having not only Botman and Fonte, who are both quite good in that aerial, in handing aerial balls in, into the box or into just in front of the penalty area, then also having a keeper inside the box who can collect quite well was a big part of why they were so strong defensively and very comfortable a lot of the time dealing with teams' attacks. So yeah, I mean, I'm not a goalkeeper specialist, but <laughs> that would be, yeah, I think he's a, I think he's a good signing for AC Milan. He definitely has an all-rounder. And like m- moving on to the back line as well, you have Sven Bortman, Selic as well, I think right, the, the right back, and you have Renato Sanchez, Nanita Moikone, Jonathan David as well. So a few words on these players as well. Who who you think probably might make it to the very top from this list? Um, okay, uh, I'll just move forward. So Botman, I think, really could. In a top system, he's had lots of hype this year. And I think, I think a lot of how good he is does come exactly from this is the perfect system for him to play in. And also being alongside Fonte, who seems to bring out a lot in every one of his defensive partners over the years. Which I think is something we we don't really know how to quantify or whatever yet, but it would be very interesting if we ever are able to because I kind of feel like and this is more and more realization after he came back and then starred with Leo with Gabriel last year as well, that he's definitely someone who brings the most out of it defenders, his partners. Um but yeah man, I think I think Botman's very, very good. I just think He's not good if you don't if if you have yeah if you give him space to defend he's not going to be good so he's kind of he's not you know he's not a fun dyke obviously but he's not even um you know someone like Matip or whatever who could probably deal in a couple different defenses yeah so with him I think he, he, you just need to find the right club the only deep consistently deep sitting teams that I can think of is pretty much at, at the very very top is Atletico Madrid. I think he'd do very well there. But yeah, I mean, if for example, and you, you guys were linked with him, I'm pretty sure Liverpool were never interested in him because it would be a nightmare with him defending all that space in behind. And you've only got to see how he's done with the at the Euro under 21s. I don't know under 21 Euros. I don't know if you've watched, but but he's been very very good in moments. And then you put him one v one in a tackle, or you give him space in. Def- in behind to defend, and he's very easy to turn. It's very easy to get in behind. So, yeah, I would say he could be he could play at the top. It just depends on the system. Celik, I wouldn't say could ever be a top, 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 like you know, playing at the very top. But I think he's just one tier below that. He's a player I like a lot, actually. Um, ever since since um his season with Pepe, I remember. There was always that that really good dynamic where he would overlap, and he was quite a good um, attacking partner for Pepe. But then I remember seeing him the next season, and almost his whole style completely changed. So he's he's very good at a, and what he does often is he joins the back three. Um, so he makes the back three with um, Fonte moving into the middle, and then Botman sitting on the left in possession. He's very good at playing vertical balls forward. So I think he's, yeah, I wouldn't ever say, you know, he's not going to be, for example, obviously not a Hakimi. Um, I wouldn't say he has a, as high a level as Reese James or Trent or whoever. But yeah, he could, uh, he's been the best right back in the league probably. And yeah, I think he's perfect. I mean, I, I know Arsenal linked and I'd really like us to get him. He's someone who's comfortable on the ball. He can overlap. He can sit in back in. So yeah, I'd be very keen to see. Sounds like a good partner to balance with Tierney as well. Uh, sorry, I think I spoke way too long then. But yeah. Yeah, we probably will we'll take one more player that you think from Lille that probably might make it a very sorry. Top. Yeah. Who would you to ask about? There's you- a couple. Okay, just just go on with a couple of things. Then. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no stress. Um, I, I guess Samari would be worth talking about since he's going to Leicester. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I'm interested to see how he does. He's also another, and I, I think another guy who's probably had, at one point had a bit too much hype. I remember people comparing him to Dombele, speaking about him being as good on the ball as Dombele. I think he's a bit more disciplined of it. Um, but yeah, no, he, he's a player I really like. Um, and I think this is a good time for him to move. I remember he was linked, what was it, to Newcastle, just generally to the Premier League about a year ago, and he was still a bit raw. But I think he'll be a good, he'll be a good signing now. I'm not sure where he fits in at Leicester. Um, I haven't watched him a lot this year though, but just, yeah, interested to see. I think he'd be a good partner with Ndidi. Um, yeah. Or Tielemans, I guess. So yeah, I guess we'll see. Um, and then who else? Jonathan David? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Jonathan David. Yeah. I think he, he started. I was quite disappointed with him for the first half of the season just because he came with such hype and I hadn't watched him. Um, but yeah, he's been, he, he's really come along. I think also what I really like about Lil, um, is they're very good at, at playing in those like sort of tight spaces in the middle. And it's because they've got like guys like Bamba, guys like Ekone, Yaziki, and especially their two forwards, Yilmaz and David are both so good on the ball. And yeah, I think that's that's what kind of kept them going, made them almost stronger in their route to the end of the season was definitely David's form. And yeah, he scored some some important winners. I can remember one against Marseille. I think there was another top team he also he also scored against in the run in. I mean, other than than Leo. <laughs> um, yeah. That's great. That's great to hear. And from Lille, we move on to another club. Uh, you talked about Lille overperforming a lot. This one is your favorite team. And this team has probably underperformed a lot in terms of uh, the attacking side. We are going to talk about Lyon, especially. They finished fourth in the league, which is probably a bit underwhelming in your opinion, isn't it? Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's partly our form did fall off at the end, but but yeah, we definitely I didn't think for much of the season we think we'd see us below third at very worst. So it was a bit disappointing. I mean, in terms of expected points, uh, Leon are on top of the table, just edging PSG. I think by a very very small margin. In terms of expected goal difference, you are in second as well behind PSG. So, I mean, and, and I mean, I looked at probably, uh, I've been looking at this particular metric, which is in terms of shooting or finishing, which is the goals minus expected goals differential, the non-penalty one. Leon has consistently been in like, the, been like amongst the 10 worst clubs in top five leagues in Europe, along with Liverpool in, in that area for probably Probably a few months now. I've been looking looking at that table for a while. Uh, whenever I see Liverpool you know, missing a lot of good chances, and at the end of the season, if I, if you look at FPRF right now, you can find that Lyon are the fourth worst side in the top five leagues in Europe when it comes to goals xG differential, the non-penalty one, and Lyon are just behind. Fulham, Sheffield United, and of course the XG underperformers, Brighton. So <laughs> this this is probably like a, a huge indicator, in my opinion. I mean, I've, I've not caught a lot of games that Lyon played this season. Probably a few of them here and there, and a few highlights and stuff. But I think the numbers probably speak for themselves, isn't it? Yeah, I guess we're in, in a similar boat then, <laughs> in terms of our fortunes this year. Um, yeah, I would say. You know, also something that I think a lot of people talk about, Brighton need a better striker or whatever, a better finisher, but then you kind of ignore that the forwards that they do have a part of why they have such a high um, sort of XG per match because they get so many chances. Guys like Mopai and stuff, Malpe, um, however you say it. Um, and I think that's kind of true for us as well. I would say, you know, I, he, he comes under a lot of a lot of heat 
from the Lyon fan base, but I'm actually quite a big fan of him. But um, Carl Toko Akambi, never, never going to be a great finisher, but he's someone who is incredibly good at snuffing out chances. Um, besides that, I think Memphis wasn't actually getting on the end of as many chances this past season. He was more of a creator, especially when we had that three with um, you know Memphis, Toko, and Tino, uh, Tino Kadawera. Um, I'm actually, I'd be interested if you know what Tino's finishing was like, because to me it seemed it seemed pretty good, or at least on average. Um, and Memphis, yeah, Memphis wasn't getting on as many chances. He's a good finisher. Um, I think the other thing is is Awa was getting putting up crazy numbers per game. Let me actually see over the last year. He, I don't have his thing up, but um, I think he was putting up like 0.4 xG as a midfielder. Um, and he's normally a good finisher, but it wasn't going in as much for him this year. So I think that probably contributes as well a lot to our underperformance. So it just feels a bit unlucky in some sense, but also part of creating comes from guys have, having guys like Toko. So yeah, it is what it is. And and with Memphis like uh, out of contract this summer and most possibly leaving, do you think Cadavere probably is fit enough to probably fill that spot? So um, I don't see Cadavere as as being the replacement for Memphis at all. Um, I think we'll either need to replace Memphis. The guy I would really love to see is um, is for us to bring. Uh, Musa Barrow in. I think from what I've watched of Barrow, I think he's, he seems like a perfect replacement for Memphis. And would also s- kind of suit us well if we had him on the left and Shirky on the right. It would be quite a nice balance. And then maybe Kodawere in the middle. Um, but yeah, so but the other thing with, with, um, with Tino is part of the reason we fell off in the second half of the season is he was running on an injured knee. And yeah, we just lost steam because that, that front three together was really, really potent. Um, and then, yeah, without it, with Slimani or whatever, we ended up changing to bringing in sort of Paqueta more as a 10. Yeah, it never really worked as well, um, even though it did. Still, we still were pretty dominant, but it wasn't as much, you know. I mean, uh, I, I kind of remember like doing a wish last year and finding Musa Vero somewhere up on, uh, on the top of, uh, I, I think, it, uh, creating the dribblers was it, it that I created, I guess. So, yeah, I think even in terms of short creating actions, I think he's somewhere around like uh, 3.2 per 90 in this area this season. So, yeah, I think probably he might be a good shout, like you said, and yeah, let's probably see where that goes because we have a lot of transfer window ahead of us. Probably a lot of activity might happen post the Euros. But one big question though, Alex, to you regarding Rudy Garcia. What do you think actually went wrong for him? Um, In terms of why he got sacked? Yeah. So I think firstly... Not a very good manager, if I'm being honest. Um, I think he's a good reactive manager, and I think he's good at building counter-attacking sort of teams, especially up against good teams. He's good at setting us up like that, which is why he got all of that hype last year. I think you'll remember he even got like coach of the year for something. I think was a Champions League coach of the year. Um, because we did play well. I mean, we were lucky against Man City, but we did play well. Played well against Juventus. Um, even played well against Bayern before it all went apart. Um, how we were set up. So yeah, I think he's got he's got some strengths. And to be to his credit, I was pretty impressed because I wouldn't have expected from him before this season to see that we had um, Paqueta and Awar as eights in that in his four four three four three three. Um. But yeah, tactically, we stayed with that for too long, especially when Kadawere 
started getting injured. Um, you know, he, he just doesn't change too much. He's very, he's very um, conservative at the back. I mean, we saw Desquilio all the time at left back rather than Bart or Kone even over. It was, yeah, lots of choices that, yeah, that were a bit disappointing. Or even, I mean, I like Thiago Mendes, but I would have liked to see more of Bruno, Men- Bruno Gumares. Um, you know, we impose on ourselves on teams more with him. And yeah, I was a bit disappointed. And then, yeah, aside from that, the actual reason he got fired because Lyon's a way too patient a club with its coach, with his coaches, um, is, yeah, his falling out of Juninho. And yeah, apparently they just didn't see eye to eye. And I don't know if you saw, but like after he, got sacked, he, he made up a whole lot of lies, seemingly. I'm sure there might be some truth in them, I'm not so sure. Um, about Juninho, so yeah, I think he's just a very difficult person to work with <laughs> as well. I'm quite happy he's out of our club. Yeah, I mean, last season's uh, probably the results in Champions League probably was a bit overblown, I guess, despite the poor league finish last season, but yeah, that's that's those are fair points that you made, and we're going to talk about his replacement as well, but just before that, I just want to ask you about the academy that Leon have and the talents that they've produced over the years. If, if you look at the players that have come, up, uh, come out from the Leon academy, you have like so Karim Menzema, Lacazette, Don Alonso, Freddy Canute, Nabil Fekir, Clement Granier, you have Samuel Umtiti, uh, Toliso. Alessand Plea, I think Anthony Martial probably was at some time in the academy as well. So yeah, you mm-hmm. have a list of some really amazing players. I mean, Gori as well, who you wrote a piece for the Scouted Handbook, Volume 9. So you have a lot of amazing talents that the academy has produced. If you look at right now, you have Usum Oar, Maxence Skakare, Ryan Shirky, um, I think... Melvin Bardas again, Franchaki and Bardas, Bard are probably the next in the line, I guess. So yeah. my question to you is, why is or why do you think the academy is like so good and so consistent at producing some really amazing players? So yeah, you told me you were going to ask me this beforehand. So I did do some, because I've never actually really looked in why we're such a good academy. I did do some research and I think... Basically, answer is kind of boring, but a lot of it does come from just the level of investment that Aulis, um has put into the club since he, he took over. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of infrastructure and investment put into, into our youth. I think we're in also in a good location where, you know, lots of players see football as their route forwards, um, to careers and, then I think just we also got lucky from from early on. My impression is that the coaching staff right from the beginning were very good at coaching the the players and built a very strong batch. And basically how we ended up building new coaches through the academy was very much like an internal one where new coaches would come in and learn from the older coaches and then that process would sort of repeat itself. So yeah, I think those would be sort of the major reasons why Lyon is um, benefits from as good an academy as it does. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing super interesting beyond that. But yeah, <laughs> that sounds that, that that actually sounds interesting though. I mean, a lot of I mean, there is like a real uh, real pathway for the youngsters to come into the senior team at a very young age and okay. you see a lot of these youngsters like probably attracting a lot of interest from Europe and they turn 20, 22 or by, by, by the time they turn like 23, they are one of the hottest prospects in the, in, in the market and you see big clubs getting linked with these players and and all us being all us uh, selling these players for a, a really good sum I think or, or yeah. All of that is probably down to a clear, uh, clear pathway to the very top. To and add, yeah, like so. sorry, just actually to add to you, I think that's also a massive aspect of it is that there is just a massive commitment to bringing through our youth at Lyon. Another reason Rudy wasn't liked, by the way, 
apparently he's the reason we let Pierre Kalulu and uh, Guiri go. Um, but yeah, there's a massive commitment, and I think basically having a commitment to developing youth and then actually being able to play them, creating spots for them. For example, we're not looking to bring in a new right back this season because we have Malo Gusto coming through. Um, I'm sure we're not going to be looking too much in midfield because we have Florent de Silva coming through. You know, a hand that has been waiting to come through. Um, Sinali, we're not bringing in another centre back because he's not an academy graduate, but but he's a young centre back we have because we're going to give him a chance coming through the first team. I think that's just a massive part of what Lyon stands for. It's why I started supporting the club um, back in 2015. I already liked them for years. Um, but yeah, so I think that's just a massive part of what makes the club so good. You know, its, it's whole ethos is about being open to bringing through youth. Yeah, and we discussed that. We, we talk about uh, probably a couple of three, three, four young players from Lyon as well. I mean, Ryan Cherky is one of the names that, again, is probably... Probably, I think, gaining traction on social media as well as probably around the footballing world as well. I mean, a lot of people, you can see a lot of people probably say, uh, probably talk a lot on Cherky. I know he's played just like 698 minutes in, in, in League One this season. Uh, although he's had like, it spread over like 27 starts. Uh, uh, not 27 um, games, I mean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that is like pretty... I know it's pretty low, but he's just like what seventeen. He was like sixteen when when the season started. So mm-hmm. it's 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 decent minutes, but I think the way that you mentioned how Rudy Garcia doesn't or didn't favor youth much, I guess under the next manager Peter Boss, it's going to be the exact opposite because he's that kind of a manager who who's going to give the young kids a lot of chance as well. So I just want you to probably brief us or brief the listeners again. Uh, like you did with Lille, probably mention a couple of names from the Leon youth system that's going to probably come through. Break, yeah, break out. Um, okay, so I think I think I'll speak about two guys that I think we will see a lot of this season um, coming through. Um, so yeah, I guess I think first it's probably nice to start off with Shirky. I'm pretty sure. Um, boss would be coming in with the understanding that we're going to be building around Shirky. If we're coming to the end of the cycle, end of a cycle with Lyon, I will be leaving and we're going to start building our club around. Memphis is leaving as well. Lots of our older players have left the season, will leave the season and left the season before. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a perfect time to, to start building around Shirky. We already should have played a more last season. Maybe I mean I'm never I'm never too much up for playing, you know, a sixteen turning seventeen year old overly much during um you know, during his teenage years, but like seven point eight nineties isn't isn't great. Uh we probably should have played him probably eighteen nineties, I think would have been good. Especially considering he's he's been more than good enough to play for us. Um but yeah, I, I think we'll see ourselves Building around him as a player, um, if I had to compare him to anyone, I would say he's kind of hazardesque, um, Eden Hazardish. Um, maybe a little bit less explosive, but more of a, a stronger build. Um, yeah, he's an interesting player, very, very good dribbler, incredible technique, um, very, very good decision maker. I mean, he has been since he was 15. Like it's one of the most impressive things about him is he's come into the team as an excellent decision maker. Um and yeah, also he's never gonna be super super explosive. At least I don't I don't see that happening, but he's very yeah, he's a he's a good athlete, uh got a strong frame. And yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to to watching him develop this season. It will also be interesting to see where he plays on the boss. There's, you know, all the possibility he actually plays a central midfield role, um, similar to maybe what Brandt played um, under boss at Leverkusen. Um, yeah, besides that, I think another player that we'll see coming into the team is Melvin Bart. 
apparently we're bringing you some guy called Enrique. I haven't watched him um, at left back. And basically the understanding is we aren't investing too much there because we don't want to put a player in the way of Melbourne Bart's development. So yeah, I think he's going to take a, a starting role. If not from the beginning of the season, he'll get into. And he's actually a player, I think, you know, they all come from this same age group um, of Guiri, um, Kakare, who's now become the most famous from that age group, um, Pierre Kululu at AC Milan, and Melvin Barton. He's always kind of the forgotten one, but I think I think he, by this time next season, he'll become far more known. Um, I'm looking forward to his him coming out. Very good attacking player. He can also play in a back three. Not that we'll really see that under Bart, but it would be interesting if Malo Gusto, who I'll get to just now, or um, Dubois push up higher, we can see that back three sort of taking place. Um, but yeah, I think personally, strong technically, I don't know if you've watched Adrian Truffer, but actually it's weirdly their comparable players. Um, same age and everything. He plays for Rennes. Um, yeah. So I'll be looking forward to that very technical, techie left back, likes bomb, bombing down the left. So yeah. Um, otherwise, players that we'll see coming into the team is Marlon Gusto. Um, he's a right back. Similar also, I think he played midfield at youth level. Um, but yeah, very techie, quite an athlete as well. Big build. I think he's still 16. Um, very quick, strong attacking, good at putting crosses in. Um, and then, yeah, Florent de Silva, who's a little bit slept on because of how good and how special Shirky is. They're in the same age group, both also attacking midfield types, but Florent's a very, very good player in his own right. Um, and yeah, very elegant sort of player. Um, good passer. Yeah. Um, and I think I'd like to see him as one of the attacking eights, maybe as a Paqueta backup, especially while um, Rain Adelaide's still injured. Yeah. Mm, that's great. That's great to hear. And the next topic is probably as expected on Peter Boss. And this is such a very, you know, I mean, for me, I think it, when I heard that Peter Boss signed for Leon, I was probably surprised because. Um, I mean, I did a we did a podcast here. Uh, we, we did a Matt Mendes' podcast a few weeks back when he was sacked by Leverkusen, talking about where his next possible destination could be. Uh, I remember myself ruling out France and <laughs> probably giving a shout again to some German side or maybe some mid-table Spanish side. Although we were like quite uh, skeptic on uh, skeptic whether he would actually fit uh, the Serie A or the Premier League because he isn't he isn't someone who's like very pragmatic or uh, yep. he, 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 yep. and I mean that side of his game is probably the weakest as we, we've seen at Dortmund uh, Ajax and even at Leverkusen as well I mean he, he came from Ajax to Dortmund and that was short lived I know that mm, that probably wasn't the greatest uh, spells in his career but he kind of steadied the ship at Leverkusen. Last season was quite okay from uh, when, if you look at it from their perspective. This season, until December, until they played Bayern Munich in December, they were like flying. They were on top of the table, I guess, and they had like a top of the table clash against Bayern Munich in December, late December. And after that loss, it was a 2 2 1 loss. It was not a very big loss either, although Bayern probably dominated most part of the game. But after that loss, everything seemed to fall apart. I mean, then that's the pattern with Peter Boss as well. I mean, you see him like performing really well, having his team play some really amazing football as well. But then suddenly it all like breaks down like glass. You see it breaking completely. I mean, he lost games against teams that he shouldn't have been losing in the Bundesliga with Bayer Leverkusen. And I think probably finally it cracked and he had to be sacked. So, do, are you like really optimistic with boss uh, Alex? Because I, even at Leverkusen, he had around like 54% win rate in total. So, 
I'm like really optimistic with Peter Boss signing and do you think like he will be able to perform better than his previous spells when, uh, in in league one um so i think the first thing is part of the excitement for a lot of lyon supporters and i think which a lot of other people have kind of missed um is that exactly kind of like you say firstly it's a big change it's not a signing that we kind of expected for ligue 1 i would have never seen boss going to ligue 1 um but but especially for lyon like we sign french managers or french speaking primarily i've heard the boss speaks i all i assume he spoke some french because he used to play in france but yeah i think he's relearning really or retouching up his language his french um yeah he's just a, he's a very different signing from from what we would have done i mean i was expecting galtier and i'm very happy as good as a coach i think galtier is i don't think he's a special coach um yeah and it, and he's just a bit of a boring appointment i can't <laughs> as a, from a personal point of view a bit uninspired or unimaginative from leon's part um yeah by no means was was boss my first choice i would have preferred onseca um he was the one i wanted for sure and then i haven't watched galado but i've heard lots of good things and he sounds exciting um and i haven't watched much of deserbi but i think he would have been good i know jinino wanted him most by the scene, by the sounds of it um but yeah i think it's just a big change for the club you know um so far more exciting coach and compared to our list of coaches from before especially the last two that with solvino in between but genesio and garcia he's a far better coach than I, either of them are and he's far more attacking and he's someone who plays the youth so he fits us in a lot of ways um which are even beyond that i am kind of yeah i i think i'm a bit optimistic about how we'll we'll do especially because i feel it's an it's a changing cycle on the one hand so i'm not necessarily expecting us to be as dominant as we were especially when we were losing guys like awa and memphis but it would have been bad under really um and yeah i think boss is just the perfect person to sort of develop the, the likes of shirky and kakare um even bart mal gusto um so yeah i think i think he's a very good coach i don't see him being with us for super long hopefully he's signed a two year contract i'd love him to to fill that contract um but yeah i also think he's a bit hard done by i will say um he's a coach i've liked since since watching him at ajax uh just cuz he plays him like really nice football um but i know he's flawed but i don't think i think people maybe overstated a bit especially there's this idea that he he starts well and crashes quickly at every club where you know he did spend two and a half years at Leverkusen um and he left Ajax after one season because he got an offer from Dortmund so yeah I'm not sure if I completely answered your question or went around it but yeah yeah no, that that's that's a actually fair answer as well I like saying I mean you probably can only I mean you can only pass out a pass out a like very fair judgment when you see him in action with the team so it's it's just i mean the appointment has done this uh, so he hasn't like played with the leon squad yet and i mean particularly speaking i think leon might probably suit him a bit more so and and like you mentioned with the attacking talents that what leon, do you think luke could suit him more just interesting hmm i i i think this probably i mean considering this might be his make or break job once again because he's had like good opportunities at the top and i think this is going to be his last good opportunity at a very top club i mean i i, I definitely think leon are like a top club so i think this might be his last opportunity at a top club for the foreseeable future so if he does well i think he is going to be able to sustain and probably get another good opportunity once this contract is done here at leon 
So, and and also considering his style, I think he might be able to brush off a lot of teams as well. So in League One, so I I mean personally speaking, I'm a bit optimistic. Although I was a bit surprised initially, but yeah, I, I'm I'm a bit optimistic about this course. <laughs> yeah, I, myself, I'm fully on the hype train. Yeah. I was, you know, there were lots of doubters when Kovac came in. Mm. Um, he's done very, very well, especially yeah. with his attacking style. So yeah, I mean, it's a move I really like for the league, for league in itself, because um, because a lot of I think it's probably well, definitely out of the top five leagues, it's has the least coaching quality. I'd say it's a league that makes Galtier look like a genius. So you know, um, and he, I think he is a good coach. I feel like I've I've been harsher on him than I intend to be, but it makes, yeah, it's not a very, very good, um, strong coaching league. It's got a lot of low block sides, but yeah, it's just, it's exciting to see more, um, coaches with more attacking intent, but also, I mean, I do regard as flawed as he is, I do regard Boss as a tactically astute manager and maybe one that suits our squad quite well. Um, I don't know if you saw my tweet about it. Not that it was a uh, big tweet or whatever, but um, but yeah, I was just thinking about how he might actually be better suited to this Lyon team given the sort of legs we have in midfield. Because his high press is for sure a bit naive and he's used it a bit naively for certain teams. But I think, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. We've got guys like Kakare and Paquette who have insane engines. Bruno Gomez as well. We're interested in Pape Matessa, someone who also has an insane engine. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see that those are all sort of guys that we can put in the middle at, who who also have a strong attacking qualities and can get back and defend well. So yeah, I'd be interested to to see how he does with us. Yeah, I mean, and hopefully, I feel uh, hopefully I, I I I expect that he he probably. Gets Leon back to the top and you know, maybe makes another title of PSG's hands for you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's up with Leon as well. And we have like around 20 minutes more in the podcast. And we have also have like a fair bit of players to discuss. This is the last segment of the podcast where we are going to discuss some of the emerging or some of the best young talents in. League One and also from the Africa region. And first of all, Alex, I mean, I know you probably sent me a lot of some really amazing names. A few of them I haven't watched at all and I wasn't aware of them at all. A few of them I've been aware of their names popping up here and there. I've seen some databases as well on them and probably a few compilations as well. So we'll straight on get into it without wasting time. You mentioned five players, Pape Matasar, Shomani from, uh, I'm, I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, from Monaco, Yasin Adli, you have Auchich, then Tere Mofi, then Akun, Akin Kunmi, Amu, Samson, Tijani as well. So these are the players that you sent me when we finalized that this will be the place that we'll speak yeah. about. So, <laughs> yep, the stage is set for you to discuss or to, to let our listeners know how good these players are and why they should be keeping an eye on these players. Um, yeah, I think, or maybe I could put a question back to you because I know you actually approached me about us doing a Papi Matasa article at some point. Mm. Um, so yeah, what, what drew you to him? I mean, I, I, I first came across his name probably when I was like doing some research on Jude Bellingham, but his... Stats probably seem to stand out a bit for me uh, in the attacking sense, to be honest. Uh, in terms of short creating actions as well, he is probably quite decent in the role that he plays. And I haven't watched much of him, probably caught one or two games, I guess. And I, I don't think probably that, that that isn't probably enough, I guess, for me to pass on a very proper judgment on him. But I'm pretty excited as well. On, on him just by seeing the data and also in those two appearances as well uh, appearances as well I thought he was like particularly fine so yes I'm pretty excited 
Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just interested in, because statis- statistically, I think a lot of people started taking note of him. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm very excited about him. Um, interestingly, like speaking about how he comes out in, in the stats, when you watch him, he's more of a defensive role, very much an eight low. Maybe he could play m- more of a sitting role if he needed to. But um, yeah, I kind of see him as similar to Kakari in some senses. Um, very vertical player. He carries more than Kakari would be more of a passer, whereas he's a vertical carrier. But yeah, he's just got an insane engine similar to Kakare. They could win ball. He, he's a strong ball winner. Um, this is his first season as well. I, I'm not sure if he's 19 yet, but but yeah, he was 18 for much of the season at least. Um, and yeah, also he was um, similarly to two of the guys we'll chat about later. Um, he was at the Under-17 World Cup in 2019. Um, the other guys being Tijani and Amu. Um, yeah, and there he actually played like an attacking midfield role. So, which does come through, I think, as good a, as a ball winner as he is. You can you can see he's got, yeah, he's got pretty much he's got an impressive passing game. He puts through some very nice vertical balls every now and then. Uh, still a bit rusty with some touches. He can be a bit awkward. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited by him. Uh, he's definitely. I think for a lot of teams that are looking for a strong sort of box to box midfielders, um, I think he ticks the boxes. <laughs> um, but yeah, like a lot of people are looking, you know, for Kakare or whatever, I would probably, I mean, Kakare is going to be expensive for whoever wants to get him. But for clubs that are speaking about the need to have a player like Kakare, he's someone I would look at now. I'm happy Lyon are uh, looking at him. Then themselves because he'd be a nice replacement for Kakri if he leaves in a season or two. Um, yeah, in terms of what impresses me the most, very rangy, so very mobile. Uh, probably just how good he is in terms of winning the ball and then immediately playing forward. Um, and yeah, he's got a strong, strong, strong creative game that I don't think we've seen as much of yet, but I think as he sort of develops more, we'll, we'll see it come through. Um, I didn't watch much of him at the at the Under-17 World Cup, but apparently uh, he was their strongest creative player. Um, yeah. That sounds very positive. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, like, like I said, uh, I'm also pretty much looking forward to it. Possibly you get to watch more more games from League One next year. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll uh, we'll go through some of his footage, yeah. but yeah, he's a player, he's a player I'm particularly high on. Yeah. Um, looking at towards next season, and we have a few more players as well. Then the, the, the guy from Monaco, Aurelien Chomeni. Yeah, yeah. Chomeni. Not too big, but he's he's a player I've loved for for eight. Maybe 2018 was the first time I watched him. Um, and he's also come on loads since then. But even then, I thought he'd be more of a sitter and a ball winner because that was sort of his style. He was a bit awkward moving with the ball back then. But now he's, yeah, I'm very Aurelian um, to many. Like he, he, if I had to say the two best midfielders, in my opinion, in the league this year, um, was him and Paqueta. Um, and yeah. He's just obscenely good. Um, only things I would say is he's a very strong ball winner. Um, maybe sometimes his first touch can let him down. Um, but other than that, I think he's quite a complete player. Um, strong vertical passer. He's a good decision maker too. Um, yeah. I don't know what more to say about him. Beyond maybe where does he go? I'm not so sure. Um, I thought Ch- I heard Chelsea were potentially interested in him, but I'm not sure if that was just Orlando. I don't know if you you know Orlando, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if that was actually just Orlando saying he wanted them to sign. Him, they've, but been, that was, they've been linked. I, I think they've been linked with him. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, he's he's a very good player. Um, kind of strong across the board. 
um, progressively, incredibly strong defensively, but then also, um, yeah, gets shots off very much also within um, Kovac's system suits him a lot. Another guy I like that often his midfield partner is um, Yusuf Fofana, who is like, yeah, I've liked him since Strasbourg. Um, yeah, also similar box to box sort of player. Yeah, that sounds very positive because uh, again, I'm pretty sure he he's going to have like good amount of shooters in the summer. I think was it was in January when Manchester United had some links with him as well. And or, or was it? Yeah, yeah, last summer or probably January if I'm not wrong. Uh, I kind of remember hearing some links with Manchester United, so we'll probably see how that plays out as well. But another player, this is someone I'm also like pretty interested in discussing about Yassi Nadli. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th- there's a big chance that he might move from Bordeaux this summer, isn't it? And I mean, you, you look at his stats from FBRF as well. I think in the last, in the past year or so, he's he's probably uh, stood out in terms of short creating actions, um, pressures as well, uh, tackling to, to an extent as well. And his expected assist number is also, or XG assisted to be honest, is, is probably the right word to use here, is also like pretty good. So where do you probably see him moving to, Alex, if, if he intends to leave Bordeaux this summer? Hmm. That's actually an interesting question. Where where would he go? Um, I think, I mean, I jokingly, well, not jokingly, but like not totally seriously thought he could be someone who came to Arsenal um, as like a, because he plays, you know, he used to play very much like a right wing and um, an attacking midfield role. Like I remember the first time I ever watched him was when I was watching for Greery at the under-17, what was it, World Cup? Or oh, under, or oh, Euros, and, you know, Adley was the other standout guy in that side, in that French side. Um, and back then, yeah, he was very much like a fluid sort of 10 or right wing. And now he he's far more, I mean, I never saw him, I never actually used to, to doubt how good he would be professionally because I had doubts about his physical capacity where I've been proved like wrong. Like he's a very, he's shown, he's a very good athlete, very strongly in control of his frame, despite how tall he is, um, balanced, you know what I mean? Um, but also, yeah, the pressures are something that I just never saw 17 year old Adley being a ball winning. What is it like four, almost four, Tackles P90. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think I kind of almost feel like he could play anyway because I think he's also very much got that controller sort of capacity that, you know, we kind of see from guys from Odegaard who can kind of play quite high up, facilitate play while playmaking, kind of almost like a, a creative water carrier for the side. Um, but then also he's obviously very good at creating shots, especially for how deep he does sometimes play. Though, yeah, he also sometimes plays either, you know, as the furthest in a in a three, sometimes as part of a four four two in the middle, and sometimes on the right of a four four two. Um, but yeah, no, where I think he could go is pretty much anywhere that needs an attacking eight. Um, that can also press nicely and defensively. Um, yeah, I think he could potentially play. I can see him playing even deeper if he needs to. Um, yeah, I don't know. He's someone I think Liverpool could actually do well with now that I think about it. If you guys had to change your team a little bit. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean... Uh, I actually remember suggesting Adley to someone probably a few weeks back. Uh, I mean, if if you want to like probably think out of the box as a thing, you know, out of the box signing. So yeah, that probably you confirming gives gives that thought like more 
for <laughs> energy, I guess. So <laughs> yeah, that's great to hear. And I mean, now I'll probably let you probably uh, probably brief on maybe a couple more players, especially from the African region. Uh, one player that uh, I, I I'll, I'll probably suggest is Kamal Dean. I mean, I know you you, you have written uh, a piece on him in the upcoming Scouted Handbook. Who, who I think he is reportedly joined Ajax. I heard African Insider like tweet that he has agreed a move to Ajax just before we started this podcast. So I'm not sure how 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 legit that particular news is. But yeah, Kamal Dean seemed to be a very attractive player from the African region. Pats in Dhaka, another so. So, so I'll, I'll just let you probably decide a few players and just let us know who you think are probably the ones to keep a, keep an eye out on. Um, so yeah, maybe I won't say too much of a comedy, so maybe read the <laughs> the yeah, handbook. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but also just because I've discussed a lot on him. Um, but yeah, I'm not surprised by the move to Ajax. They've been the leading guys for him um, for a while now. Um, apparently, Overmars was watching the last few, like the last few games of him at, or at least one of them, one game. Um, he was there in person to watch Kamal Dean, and Kamal Dean had a really, really good game. I think he might have been there after. Um, and yeah, and then Kamal Dean, I think his agent even said something about Ajax. But it's a good next step for him. Um, a couple of months ago, he even I thought he wasn't ready yet. I uh, thought he'd need like at least another half season in Denmark, but but yeah, I think he's ready, and yeah, it will be interesting to see where he plays, right? Because they have Tadic playing with the left a lot of the time. Um, they have Anthony on the right. Obviously, Kamaldin can play across um, the front line, and then they they're trying to get Robbie back. I heard that's what Ajax are trying to do. After just losing him, um, apparently they've had like some sort of reshuffle. I'm not sure if that's, but yeah, um, <laughs> that's what I've heard. Um, and yeah, they have who 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 else do they have at center forward? They have I've forgotten his name now, but French number twenty two for them. So that's in Halab, Halab designing. Yeah, so I'll be interested to see where they fit him in, but they, yeah, I think he'd be good as long as he gets minutes for them. Um, Dhaka, I'm very interested to see where he goes. I heard West Ham are, inter- are interested in him. I think he'd be potentially a very, very, very good signing for them. Um, I'll be a bit sad if he goes to West Ham, I won't lie. Um, but yeah, if I was him, I think Bundesliga would be a perfect next step. Maybe a club like Gladbach, um, if they can afford him. Maybe, yeah, maybe Red Bull Salzburg. I don't know who, who they have at the moment, though. I mean, not Red Bull Salzburg, Leipzig, RB Leipzig, Rasen Wolfsburg. Um, yeah. Or even potentially as an option, if I was Dortmund, I'd probably go for Tammy to replace Holland, but Darko would be a great replacement, too. Um, yeah. Yeah. The guy. The yeah, guy Leipzig, might... yeah. The Yeah. Oh, the Leipzig yeah. link probably uh, makes a lot of sense as well because they have struggled quite a bit this season uh, due to not having you know that that goal scoring centre forward. They had Timo Werner scoring lo- loads for them last season and this season they, they they lost him and they couldn't really replace him with neither Saul or Yusuf Paulson or I think Huang Hee Chan hasn't probably found his feet uh, yet. So that probably hasn't worked a lot. So maybe Patson Dhaka could, could turn out to be that player that they might have. And he's, he's worked with Jesse Marsh as well. So that, that probably makes a lot of sense. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see where he goes. Um, yeah. In another life, I wish you know he could have played for Arsenal, but it doesn't make sense. <laughs> or Leon. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we'll we'll probably end this episode with a couple more names, Alex. 
who okay. came from the African region is like really so I guess I know yeah we were interested in speaking about Tijani and Amu uh, two guys that I watched at youth level for Nigeria and yeah so one of them is at Hamabi the other one is at um well actually at um Salzburg but spent the season on loan at Hartberg um so yeah, I guess I'll start with Tijani, the second one I spoke about. Um, he, got, he was the captain for Nigeria at the under-19 Af- AFCON and the no, under-17 AFCON in 2019 and the under-17 World Cup that same year. Um, yeah, so he's kind of like, I know he has a bad rep, but I kind of see him a bit Jorginho except maybe more mobile and a lot of potential as a ball winner, also good press resistance. Um, yeah, apparently, so from when I, when I watched, there were two guys that really, really stood out to me, especially from the AFCON. Um, and that was, one of them was Tijani. Um, and yeah, I think apparently he struggled a bit at Hartberg. His numbers don't look that great this season. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, it's, he's 18. Um, and normally the first thing that, that, um, Salzburg do whenever they get players coming from Africa is they send them to the second division side, Lutheran, um, that they, I think they own as well, um, that the Red Bull company owns. And that's where a lot of players, you know, sort of, you know, get their, earn their straps. Stripes, um, yeah, guys like Pats and Daka have done exactly that, Mwepu. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting that he actually, they loaned him out to to a first division team. I think it shows kind of a lot of faith. I don't think he was quite ready for that level. I've, I've watched a game and then a number of like Weisskart highlight things. Um, it's kind of interesting, like his touch looks a lot worse than it was, than it did at youth level. Like more so than, you know, obviously it's a different, it's a step up, but more so than I would have expected. So I think it's also just been a bit of a pressure thing, but I think, yeah, as long as they're patient with him, he was, he was very impressive. He's a very good, quick decision maker. Um, he's a good ball winner. He's good. He's got good press resistance. Um, but yeah, the reason I compared him to Jorginho is, he, he's, you know, he likes making those short sort of, metronome type passes um yeah i quite like him a lot um hopefully he goes back to them this season i'm not sure if he'll spend like half a season at leafering or or what the case will be um and then the other guy is akinkumi amu and he actually didn't really he was probably he was probably one of the five best players i would say in that squad especially at the world cup actually world cup he had a very good world cup over across the two tournaments i would say the fifth or so best player, but he's actually exploded at Hammerby. Um, so yeah, I'll be interested to see, yeah, how he how he comes along. But yeah, personally, that's been like an interesting sort of learning curve for me, just seeing how different players adapt to different levels. Um, Hammerby's in the um, Allsvenskan um, Swedish league, and yeah. He's, he didn't start a lot of last season, I think, but he played a lot in, in their cup run. I'm actually not sure. I was intending to watch the game, but then life got busy. If they ended up winning the, the cup final. Um, but yeah, he led them to their, like a cup final. They hadn't won a league, a, a cup final in ages. So yeah, he, he's had a good start there. And this season, I've watched two of his games um, since the Oswald's gun started. Um, and yeah, he's been super impressive in both. Uh, it's very hard to think of how to describe him, but he is kind of, he, he shares some similarities with Doku. I think that comes from, they're just both mad explosive players, very good close control too. Um, yeah, interesting thing about Amu is especially, he likes to actually take players on in close gaps because of the reward of, you know, if you can get through that close gap, there's a lot of space behind and generally higher chances. So he 
you know, where, where certain guys will, will like to sort of keep onto the ball as long as possible and progress up the field. Armour quite likes to burst through, take chances through, tie their gaps. So he's quite an exciting player to watch. Um, and yeah, he's developing very, very quickly. I think by the end of the current um, season that's ongoing, it only started at the beginning of this year. Um, yeah, I think I think they'll do they'll do well. Um, he'll he'll be more known. He'll probably have a scouted issue at some point. <laughs> so it's not, it's not I, I mean, I mean, if if you make it on scouted, you're bound to probably go. go, go <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, a lot of scouted prop on this particular episode. I hope the guys at scouted listen to this and like pay us a commission for this. <laughs> yeah. So, so this probably brings us to the end of the podcast. I mean, I know you've spoken a lot on a different on different GCs as well as well as uh, on, on the timeline. So, speaking to you on a podcast. And hearing you talk about a lot of players and a lot of insightful, <laughs> insightful, you know, insightful words on a lot of amazing young players as well as really great, especially for the Netflix system brand. So thank you so much, Alex, for coming on to this episode. It was an absolute pleasure. I'm not so sure, but but yeah, <laughs> it was an absolute pleasure hosting you. So it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure being hosted, and yeah, thanks so much. Nice yeah. to speak. Greg. So once again to all our listeners, if you like our content, do follow us on social media, uh, subscribe to our podcast as well. And if you think we probably are really, really worth investing, then do subscribe to us on Patreon as well. So until the next episode, bye bye. Take care.